this is the story really of an accidental uh, project. And why do I say, uh, why do I say accidental? Um, it happens that when I first started at UCSD, there was uh, a material uh, called graphene that we all have heard of uh, that, was, that was all the rage. Um, it won the Nobel Prize around that time. Um, and there were something like 17 papers a day on graphene, something like that. And I thought, uh, it, could there be a worse strategy for a new assistant professor than to work on something that already had 17 papers a day on it? Uh, but I had a student who, uh, who is a, a very uh, a bright student, uh, Alex Zaretsky, who really wanted to work on graphene. He had done an REU um, a couple summers earlier at, uh, at Cornell. He got really interested in this material, but we didn't really have any funding to work on it. So he, uh, he won a, a, a one-year fellowship from uh, what used to be called the Von Liebig Center at UCSD for a small business plan competition. Then he won another three years of funding from NSF. So basically, I didn't have to write a grant to support his salary, and he could work on whatever he, he wanted. Uh, and, that was, uh, and that was graphene. And I said, OK, we can do this, but it's got to fit into the kind of mechanical thin film theme of the lab. And also, I don't want to pay like thousands of dollars for a piece of single layer graphene this big. So we got to find a better way to make it. So what had been uh, happening at the time, like the way that graphene was, was made was that you would grow it. There are a lot of different ways to make graphene of various qualities. But what, what you typically did was grow it on a thin or on a, on a copper foil same thickness as aluminum, like kitchen aluminum foil. You would grow it on the copper foil, which is tens of microns thick. Uh, and then you, uh, you grow one layer of graphene, and then you etch the, uh, the copper, in, which is really high purity copper, in ferric chloride solution. So some of you are interested in environmental science and clean uh, energy and manufacturing. Now that means that it took about 10,000 grams of copper to produce one gram of graphene. So not a very, uh, not a very green process. So, uh, so some other ideas had actually been, uh, been developed by others in the field at the time that are kind of similar to this. Uh, but this was, this was Alex's approach. So you grow the graphene on copper foil, and then you deposit a sacrificial adhesive, which uh, has the characteristic that it's much thinner than the copper foil, so you need less of it, and also it has better adhesion to graphene than copper has to graphene, so it sticks better. Then you apply this thermal release tape, uh, and you strip the graphene off the, uh, off the copper foil. Then you take the thermal release tape, and simultaneously you debond the graphene from the thermal release tape and bond it to a plastic foil bearing a thermoplastic adhesive. So you're transferring the graphene from this uh, plastic substrate to this plastic substrate. Then you're etching, the, uh, you're etching the sacrificial adhesive instead of the copper. And the copper is available to do further, uh, further rounds of deposition. So you're, you're able to recycle it. And uh, in full disclosure, um, we submitted a patent to, for this uh, process, and uh, Alex uh, started a company, Grolltex, which is uh, located in Scripps Ranch. And I say that uh, not because I want you to go on your cell phones and buy graphene from Grolltex, which you could do, uh, but, uh, but just to show you like, how quickly inventions can get out of the lab and into commercial development. All right, so this is, uh, this is the transparency of graphene. It's 90, it's, this is greater than 95% transparency. Typically, it's measured at 550 nanometers. And this is a Raman spectrum. Now, a Raman spectrum, um, as I talked about earlier in the course, uh, is a, a measurement of vibrational frequencies of the atoms within the, uh, within the material. And what you can see here is that this is the first 
synthesis on, on fresh copper foil. This is the second synthesis. This is the third synthesis. And what do you notice here? There's this, this peak that we call the D peak. The D peak, uh, it doesn't stand for defects, but it correlates with the number of defects in the graphene. And interestingly, you can see that the quality of the graphene actually improves over time. So what you do is you measure the D to G uh, ratio and the D to G ratio decreases over time. This could be for a few different reasons. Uh, one is that the more you use the copper foil, you're re-annealing uh, it, uh, you're, you're, you're exposing it to this cyclic uh, temperature increase, which can improve the, the, uh, the crystalline quality of the graphene. Also, this mechanical exfoliation process can serve to strip impurities uh, off, of, uh, off of the graphene. And also, what you get in some cases are, uh, are islands that grow underneath the single layer of graphene, and these are double, triple, quadruple layers, and those will actually seed the, or nucleate the formation of subsequent graphene sheets, which, which can actually cause them to be bigger and less defective over time. So, uh, so one of the things that we were doing, uh, that we were thinking about once, so we want to do something totally different with graphene, stuff that had not been done in any of the 17 papers per day that had been published uh, on graphene. So one of the, the cool things, um, now this is something that we've, we've talked about earlier in the class, how making structures laterally thin is difficult because you need e-beam lithography and then photolithography and it involves many steps of deposition and so forth. Whereas making structures that are vertically thin is relatively easy because you just need to deposit films by e-beam evaporation or spin coating. But they're vertically thin. They have no lateral information. You can't write with them and they're not these you know, uh, lateral features. Graphene, however, is the thinnest, uh, the, the thinnest material that we know about, graphene and other 2D materials. So what if you could take graphene and put it on its side, and then it's a lateral feature, and then it's really thin. So could you, how, how might you do that? Well, there's a tool uh, called an ultramicrotome, which is a tool that's used for preparing samples for electron microscopy. It uses a, a single crystal diamond blade that is ground to a, that's processed to a two nanometer radius of curvature and can slice through, uh, through anything with uh, and make very, very thin sections. So it's almost like a deli slicer, but it works on the nanoscale. So this is graphene on copper foil. We strip it off with gold and then we, make, then we put another layer of gold uh, on top and we, we flip it over. So now we've got this gold graphene gold sandwich. We take this gold graphene gold sandwich and we chop it up in the ultra microtome. This is a technique uh, that, uh, that in grad school we nicknamed nano skiving. Uh, and turns out that skiving in British English means slacking off. So you're slacking off at very, with very thin, uh, in, in very small increments. But skiving really also means like shearing thin sections off of off of materials. Okay, so now we have these uh, these these sections of this this gold graphene gold sandwich, and we get a different morphology depending on if the blade slices it this way or slices it this way. And it just happens to be how the materials are compressed. It turns out that if you section uh, with a direction perpendicular to the nanowire or to the this this nanowire. Actually, it's like a gold nanowire completely bifurcated by a graphene ribbon in, in between. Uh, that you get, a, you get kind of a better quality here. Here it's kind of split open in the middle. Okay. So what do we get then? We can take a surface-enhanced en surface Raman scattering spectrum of the graphene ribbon that's bisecting this gold nanowire, and we see something interesting. So it's not really a surprise that we get a huge defect peak from this because we're taking this diamond blade and chopping it, right? So it rips the bonds apart, creates lots of defects. But if you put this in the plasma cleaner and you etch away all the, defect, the defective areas that are kind of spilling out of the nanowire, the defect peak actually goes down. But then this other peak, which is associated with out-of-plane bends also disappears. So what is going on there? 
one of the, well, the hypothesis we had was that because we're putting this graphene nano ribbon in this gold uh, nanowire, we're squeezing those modes kind of out of existence. So we're kind of like compressing it so that the graphene can no longer uh, bend out of plane. So we tested this hypothesis uh, by uh, doing the following thing. So in elementary school, I don't know if any of you had ever like played with a parachute, like you get 20 kids around a parachute and you kind of like, I don't know what you do with it, but you play with it. And, uh, and these like waves form in the parachute. But what if you were doing it and you started shoveling snow or rocks on the parachute? You would lose those out of plane deformations. So what we tried doing was dumping a bunch of gold because gold, you know, why do snow when you can do gold? Uh, so we dumped a bunch of gold particles by E-beam evaporation on these materials. And what we saw was a reduction in these out of plane bending peaks. So we're weighing down the graphene to suppress these, these, uh, these motions. Uh, so we kind of showed that that, that hypothesis was, uh, was uh, supported here. Another thing we did was, was we did Raman spectroscopy of this graphene nanoribbon as a function of polarization of the excitation laser. And it turns out that you get a Raman signal when you are polarized, uh, when you're polarized perpendicular to the gap because that's where the localized surface plasmons resonate in the short dimension. They don't resonate along the big dimension. They resonate along the short dimension. So this is kind of an, an interesting plot where you're slowly changing the polarization from parallel where you, where you get no Raman scattering to perpendicular where you get the maximum Raman scattering. Okay, now you might look at these structures and say, well, that's kind of interesting. Why are those globular structures? Why aren't they, why isn't it forming a nice clean film? Why is it forming these island structures? So this is uh, a case where um, the, the project gets a little bit more accidental and therefore a little bit more interesting. So in the early stages of thin film growth, you often get these island-like morphologies, but they're actually quite difficult to control. Now, because we were testing out all these different sacrificial adhesives and substrates, we saw that the nano island morphology that formed depended on the substrate supporting the graphene. Now, that's very interesting. What do I mean by that? So here we are just evaporating on the, on the surface. And if you look at the top, uh, the top row of images, you have gold. Each one of these nano island structures are, are, are gold, and then here they're silver. But what we're changing in each one is the substrate supporting the graphene. So copper, nickel, gold, silver, silicon dioxide. And you'll notice that we're getting completely different morphologies from this kind of percolated structure to this less percolated structure that has these nanoscale gaps in between to these really nice faceted nanocrystals. Here's a nice little triangle and trapezoid. Uh, and then we get these more blob-like structures as we go from left to right here. Now what we're doing is actually decreasing, uh, there, there are a lot of effects here, but one of them is that we're decreasing the surface energy of the layer supporting the graphene. Now that's kind of interesting, that's below the graphene. The metal's being deposited on top of the graphene, so why should the, why should the layer below make a difference? There's a phenomenon that's very controversial in this field, uh, but, but, it, but it, 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 is, it is real to some extent, is a concept of wetting transparency. So, Imagine, uh, and that is that graphene is so thin that its van der Waals coefficient is affected by the layer beneath. Now really that shouldn't surprise us because when we, when we calculated all of the van der Waals uh, potential energy functions for all of those different geometries, we considered the layers deep into the, into the, the objects, right? So it shouldn't surprise us totally but, it, but it, is very, uh, it is very interesting. It's like taking a windshield that's been covered with Rain-X and then putting graphene on it, and then the water still beads up as though the graphene is Rain-X. Uh, or taking a car windshield and plasma oxidizing it, or wiping it down with nitric acid to make sure that you oxidize the whole surface. <laughs> 
Uh, and then you put graphene on, and then the water spreads, even though the water is only ever in contact with graphene. Okay, so that had been observed, effects like that had been observed for liquid films, liquid droplets, but not necessarily for an evaporated flux of metal atoms. So why is that interesting? Well, some of these structures have really small gaps here. We've got these kind of nano wire brain-like, uh, ribbon-like structures. They look really uh, inviting for strain sensing. Strain sensing in a number of ways. One, if you stretch these things out, you change the tunneling probability of electrons from one island to the next. Uh, you also change the localized surface plasmon resonances of these structures by separating the gaps and you change the ability of, of plasmon resonances to couple from one particle to the next. That could also be useful. Uh, my student, Sam uh, Root, who's now a postdoc uh, at Harvard, actually with my old PhD advisor, did this uh, atomistic dynamic simulation, uh, which kind of predicted the nanoscale morphology that you get at really, really low nominal thicknesses. So these are just a couple of, of nanometers. Now, we say nanometers, that's the, the thickness that's registered within the evaporation chamber. Obviously, this, this is zero here, and then this is like 10 here or something, but that's the average uh, thickness. So let's see how, how good of strain sensitivity, how good of strain sensors they are. So this is a palladium uh, kind of granular nano, nano particle, nano island film on, uh, on graphene. And this is a glass cover slip, the same, that you would same as you would use to do optical microscopy. And this is a uh, polyamid tape that's 13 microns thick. You press down here and you get a big change in resistance. So this uh, bending strain is about uh, one thousandth of one percent, and that's, a, that's approximately the same uh, scale of deformation as taking something the thickness of a hair and uh, the diameter of a hair and stretching it by about one atom. That's about one thousandth of one uh, percent. And, uh, and what you can do, this is just kind of a simple physiological measurement, is you can slap it on your wrist and you can measure the pulse pressure uh, waveform. And actually, you can get this thing called the dichrotic notch, which is where the a kind of a, 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 uh, a transient change in pressure due to the closing of the aortic valve in your heart. Um, and you can measure that, so that you can resolve that with this. Also, the dynamic range is quite good, so if you put this on not glass, but on a stretchable substrate like silicone rubber, you can actually stretch it reversibly up to, uh, in this case, 9%, but we have since, uh, since then developed some ways to make it much more stretchy, up to about 80%. Okay, so at this point, we, uh, we filed a, a patent on, on this as well, and our, uh, our licensing officer at the tech transfer uh, office at UCSD, Office of Innovation and Commercialization, put us in contact with a group in the bioengineering department that, uh, that wanted a method of doing high throughput measurements of the contractions of cardiomyocytes. Now, why is that interesting? Because cardiomyocytes, uh, those are heart muscle cells, are uh, sensitive to a wide range of, of drugs. They're also susceptible to a lot of different genetic cardiomyopathies, so arrhythmias and other types of cardiac defects that manifest at the cellular uh, level. And what, uh, what the researchers wanted was a platform to be able to screen uh, the effect of drugs on the contractility of these, uh, these cells. So, uh, so uh, my student, uh, Alex, along with uh, Alex Sachenko and Elena Molikanova, um, did this experiment where they, uh, they put the, uh, neonatal rat cardiomyocytes on the uh, graphene sensors, butter side down, so the, uh, the, the cells were adhered to the graphene. And so this is a video. This is a, a cluster of cardiomyocytes, and you can see them pumping kind of eerie, you can see them pumping. And here, uh, what you can do is you can measure the, uh, the potential at constant uh, current and you can resolve with very fine detail the, uh, the contractions. 
Now, we hope that eventually we'll be able to do this in a 96-well uh, microarray format and also to be able to, um, to do this with, uh, with human-derived cardiomyocytes so we can start introducing the uh, kind of human element earlier on in the drug discovery process. Okay, so I talked a little bit about uh, localized surface plasmon resonances in several uh, times in the, in the course and also uh, surface enhanced Raman scattering. So this project took, uh, this was done by uh, uh, Brandon Marin, who is now an R&D engineer at Intel in Arizona. And what, uh, what he did was sort of incubate these gold nano ions, gold or silver also work with this thiol. So uh, this is benzene thiolate that's stuck to the surface of gold. Now the hypothesis is that if you stretch these things, these nanowire film or nano ion films out, you're decreasing or you're increasing the spacing between the nanowires or nano islands. You're, you're increasing the spacing between the nano islands and you're also attenuating the strength of the electric field between the islands. The electric field is generated by your Raman excitation laser. And if you decrease the strength of the electric field, the scattering, the Raman scattering pro probability of the benzene thiolate also decreases. Okay, so the strength of the electric field is non-linearly dependent on the spacing between the islands and the probability that benzene thiolate is going to scatter is non-linearly dependent on the strength of the electric field. Okay, so we have these compounded nonlinear effects. And if you, if you multiply them together, we, think, we hypothesize that you should be able to make like the most sensitive optical strain sensor ever because you have these compounded nonlinear effects. So, uh, so this, is, this was actually the, the graphical abstract for the paper where you took these islands on a glass slide and, uh, and you got this really strong Raman signal, and then you, you bent it a little bit, so you separated these just like a tiny, tiny fraction, and, this, and the uh, Raman scattering signal basically disappears. So what this uh, modality potentially allows you to do is to work with, to measure biomechanics of cells that don't beat on their own because cardiomyocytes just they just beat and it's a good thing too right because we don't have to like tell our heart to beat it just does uh, but there are other types of cells like muscle cells that you have to send a signal to so what if we want to measure the health of cells that don't beat automatically this is an optical mechanism so what it's possible to do uh, uh, actually I'll show that in a slide <laughs> or two. Uh, this is just a little bit more on the, on the physics. So there's actually a polarization dependence of this effect. So these, uh, so if you, if you polarize the light parallel to the strain, you get, uh, you get a, a big Raman signal. And if you polarize, um, so if you polarize perpendicular, you get a big Raman signal. If you polarize parallel, you get an attenuated signal. And then this shows at various angles the amount to which it's uh, attenuated for both silver and gold. You can also measure, now this looks really, uh, really complicated here, but it's, it's not so bad, trust me. Um, this is a gradient of strain. So we have, uh, we have, uh, we basically what we did was, is bend the cover slip um, and there's a bit of an arc and there's a, a, uh, a reduction in strain from the peak strain all the way to the, uh, to the end. And you can actually measure the, uh, the reduction in, uh, in strain by, uh, by increase of the surface uh, intensity, or the surface enhanced Raman intensity as you go from left to right on this gradient. Okay. And then using uh, various uh, uh, analyses, you can get something like a gauge factor, which is the way that uh, that strain sensors are usually, that the sensitivity of strain sensors is usually measured. Okay, so back to the cells. These are myoblast cells. Um, they are, uh, they're, they're um, stem cell uh, derived. And if you point the Raman laser at the periphery of this cluster of myoblast cells, and then you use the conductivity of the graphene to stimulate a contraction, 
using, uh, using an AC signal. So you, you're kind of simulating this potential that would normally be delivered by an afferent neuron from your brain to your spinal cord to the muscle to signal it to contract. You're doing that artificially using the graphene. So you're, si you're, you're simulating this contraction and then you're measuring the contraction. Now, okay, we've already used up the electrical modality, right? So we can't use it to simulate the cell and also to measure the contraction. But now we have this optical technique. So if you, if you measure the SERS intensity, so the electrical signal's off, now it's on, the cell is contracted. It's off, it's on, the cell is contracted. You pull the nano islands apart, the SERS intensity goes down. And over and over and over again. Now notice that there's an upward drift of this, uh, this bottom signal. That's because for as strong as graphene is, the myoblasts are stronger and they're literally ripping it apart with every, uh, every contraction. So this is actually a degradation over time. We'd have to find some way to stabilize uh, the graphene um, using microfabricated structures. But this is actually a really interesting uh, thing. I can't, I can't actually believe this worked. <laughs> like it was just kind of an idea my uh, student had and then uh, a couple of weeks later it, it actually did work. Okay. One of the elephants in the room about mechanical sensors is that they also tend to be temperature sensors. And that's because of thermal expansion and contraction. You're, you're, you're also changing the charge carrier uh, mobility in materials. You're changing the electrical resistivity of materials when you change the temperatures. Some materials it goes up, some materials it goes down. Now we have an advantage in our system because Metal has a positive temperature coefficient of resistance, and graphene has a negative temperature coefficient of resistance. So the hypothesis is that there's like a sweet spot, like a, my porridge is too hot, my porridge is too cold, my porridge is just right. And uh, it happens that if you add just the right amount of metal uh, to it, you can make a sensor that's not sensitive to thermal drift. Now why do we care about that? Suppose you're making a wearable sensor, and is, it was cold this morning and you want to go outside, you don't want the temperature to change. You don't want the, the response of the sensor to change. So here is a kind of uh, sub, this is, this, this is dominated by, uh, by graphene at four nominal nanometers. So we have an overall negative TCR. If we have 11 nanometers, we have lots of metal and we have an overall positive TCR. Now I left this spot in the middle blank because there's the Goldilocks uh, zone. At 10 no nominal nanometers of thickness, we have a very stable temperature coefficient of resistance and we should be able to go from about 25 C to 55 C. I hope that no one lives in a place that's 55 or 60 C too often during the year. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, you should be able to wear your sensor out there. It should be fun. Okay, and this works with both, uh, both silver and gold structures. Um, you can do some image analysis using MATLAB to, uh, to uh, correlate the fractional coverage of these nano island structures to the temperature coefficient of resistance. And then you can do things like measure your pulse pressure waveform in the hot and cold uh, and using uh, the right amount of nanowires or nano island uh, film, you get a, a relatively uh, stable signal. Okay, another application. We were uh, approached by a team of researchers um, at uh, UCSD and MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, as a part of a big collaboration and the goal was to develop a device to measure the swallowing activity of head and neck cancer survivors. Now, why is that important? Because when somebody with laryngeal or pharyngeal cancer gets radiation therapy, the m swallowing muscles have the, uh, have the propensity to develop fibrosis and they lose the ability to, uh, to swallow or they develop very painful swallowing, it also affects their, uh, their speaking um, as well and really reduces the quality of life. Now there are 
methods of preventing this dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, from manifesting, but they involve um, uh, exercises, like home-based exercises that a speech pathologist prescribes, and the patients have to do these things when they go home. So the goal was really, uh, so, uh, so head and neck cancer is a huge problem, lots of, uh, lots of loss in quality of life and uh, high mortality rates. Uh, so the goal was to develop a, uh, like, a, like an app that would kind of grade your performance and also monitor your swallowing activity over time using a device that, uh, that was unobtrusive and maybe you couldn't even feel it if it was on the skin. Now, the standard of care to measure swallowing activity is to do a, a barium swallow test, which is where you eat this gross uh, paste that has a lot of barium in it because it's heavy, uh, heavy, uh, heavy uh, element, and you do in vivo uh, video flu x-ray fluoroscopy where you get a video x-ray of, uh, of your oral cavity and esophagus while you swallow and, uh, and you can measure dysphagia. Now, if, can we, if we can get data that are even as close to as good as, as that at home, that would be way better, right? So this is kind of, uh, this work actually uh, was done by Julian, your, uh, your TA, and this paper is no longer just submitted, it's published in ACS Nano. And so this is a fabrication scheme. We use these palladium uh, granular islands on graphene. And my students, uh, Julian and Daniel, uh, traveled to, uh, to MD Anderson to put these devices on a patient cohort. So there were 14 patients, set, all, of, all of whom had had radiation therapy on their, uh, on their uh, uh, head and neck cancer. And seven of them had already developed dysphagia, and seven of the cohort had not yet developed dysphagia. So here are what the data looked like. Um, these, this is evidence of a, and, and also we use two different modalities. We use the nano island sensors to measure strain, and on the opposite side of the neck, we used a conventional electromyography electrodes to measure the electrical activity in the muscles, and then we could compare the, the two uh, methods. So you can sort of see qualitatively, a dysphagic swallow is, this is evidence of, of struggle. Notice the time scale is much longer. This is a normal swallow from a non-dysphagic patient, um, and these are all uh, 10 mils of water. So they call that in the business the bolus, what bolus is being swallowed in this case. And those are quite standardized, and these are all, these are all water in this case. Okay, so eyeball spectrometer, you know, this one took a really long time, 16 seconds to swallow 10 mils of water. Imagine if it took that long to swallow 10 mils of water. So it's a really serious problem. These are, uh, these are the results from non-dysphagic patients swallowing different types of, uh, or non-dysphagic non subjects uh, swallowing uh, different boluses, so water, yogurt, and then a chewed up cracker. What's useful about combining both electromyography and the strain data is that we can differentiate motion artifacts. So that is artifacts like moving your head or talking, um, from swallowing, because moving your head might engage the strain sensor, but it won't engage the electromyography sensor because those muscles are not involved in swallowing. So you could see, for example, uh, turning the head engages both EMG and strain, whereas uh, swallowing is, uh, is um, you know, we, we, we still get a swallowing uh, signal here. Uh, coughing is a good example where we are, uh, we're engaging the head and neck, uh, 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 we're, we're engaging the strain but not the, swallow, not the electrical, electrical activity in the swallowing muscles. So it's a way of decoupling these um, signals. We also compared with the gold standard, so th these are still images from uh, video fluoroscopy of the patients from which we also uh, we also um, we, we also collected the strain and EMG data. So th these are the strain data as the uh, as the food bolus is passing 
from the oral cavity into the esophagus and then on into the stomach. And then this is a dysphagic swallow. So what you can see here, uh, they tell us that this, is, this, uh, this event here is called piecemeal deglutition, where the food bolus breaks apart multiple times and it takes several, uh, several um, efforts really to swallow it. Okay, so we can kind of by eyeball spectrometer again, do differentiation of swallowing activity, identification of boluses and non-swallowing events. Uh, but we also worked with C.K. Chang's group in, uh, in electrical engineering. And the idea was to do this scoring automatically. So has anybody seen um, Silicon Valley, the HBO show? Um, so there's a scene in there where one of the characters makes a, an app that uh, can differentiate things th that are hot dogs from those that are not hot dogs. <laughs> That's the only thing it does. Um, we can do a lot better than that. We can differentiate uh, water from yogurt to a, from a cracker. So you train up the, the machine learning algorithm and then you feed it an unknown signal and then you can score it and then the top score, uh, the top score wins. So in this case, we have a water bolus. Okay, the esophagus is, is, is a big tube, but there are, Applications in biomechanical sensing where we are going to send cells and stuff through very small tubes. So my uh, postdoc, uh, Charles Dong, did this uh, project. And the idea was to embed the sensor in the sidewalls of a microfluidic channel. Now, a microfluidic channel, if it's made of a deformable material, will actually expand and contract with the flow rate, the viscosity, or the mechanical properties of fluids and objects that transit the channel. So if you can embed the sensor in the sidewall of the channel, you should be able, in principle, to back calculate by various uh, mechanical models the, uh, the properties of the object or fluid transiting the channel. So here's what it looks like. This is uh, a, a liquid and it deforms the sidewall. This is a gas bubble, it deforms the sidewall, and a solid might deform the sidewall in a different way. These are kind of like hypothetical uh, drawings. Uh, the, uh, but what this should give you is a plot of resistance, electrical resistance versus time, that is a characteristic shape that if you do all of the, uh, the fluid mechanics uh, uh, analysis correctly, you should be able to get some useful information out of these, this, uh, this, this deformation signature. So here's kind of a schematic diagram. Here's the nano island film. Here's the microchannel. And then you inject the fluid in here, and then it comes out the other end using palladium nano islands again on graphene. And here's an optical micrograph of the channel. Here's a calibration curve that shows the, uh, that shows the change in resistance as a, uh, as, uh, in this case, as a function of uh, flow, uh, flow rate. And this was published uh, last year in NanoLet. So you can detect not just fluids, but individual particles. So this plot in the top right here is a, a, uh, a silica microsphere that traverses the channel. And these are actually one-dimensional slices of a video as the particle transits the channel and you get this deformation signature. Now how about a deformable uh, particle? This is a human uh, mesenchymal stem cell and it's much, much smaller. Uh, so actually we're barely able to resolve it uh, going through the channel, but nevertheless we could. Notice that the change in resistance is much smaller because the particle is smaller and also deformable. So we get this deformation signature. And there's a lot of stuff we wanna do with this type of device like measure for the presence of circulating tumor cells, which have different sizes and deformabilities than blood cells. We are interested in measuring mechanotransduction in cells, that is mechanically responsive cells, like nerve cells, like cells in the bladder, in the stomach, and, um, uh, and in the um, uh, endothelium, in the veins that self-regulate blood pressure. There are a lot of reasons why, uh, why one might be interested in putting mechanical forces on cells and measuring the responses. So we'd be interested in doing this in a multiplexed way for high throughput measurement and also using 
machine learning to do automatic classification of, say, you see this, is that a, is that a tumor cell or what kind of cell is it? So that's kind of the, the, uh, the dream for this uh, project. So uh, in, in, in summary, the metal nanoislands on graphene are interesting because both materials are, have, have, uh, are conductive like metals. So you have two conductive materials, but when you combine them together in this, in this way with these particles on this uh, 2D film, you actually get properties that are kind of gateable. They're, you can kind of put signals on them that change the conductivity a lot. So, uh, so they're almost like a semiconductor in that sense. They're not really a semiconductor, but, uh, but you can, you can uh, get signals out of them like you could a, se a semiconductor. So, uh, so since, since we've done this work, we have some unpublished work that says we can actually reduce the strain uh, or increase the strain sensitivity by about an order of magnitude. So now one part per million in strain sensitivity. We can combine sensitivity and dynamic range, ease of preparation, environmental stability, manipulability, my favorite word where means you can manipulate it, uh, semi-transparency and near zero uh, temperature coefficient of resistance. And then uh, my student Brandon and Julian published this review article in Nanoscale Horizons. And there are a lot of other groups doing other things with nanoparticles on graphene and they're useful for a wide variety of things. So, uh, so the work here was done by uh, people that I highlighted as we went. Um, people in blue are professors. Um, uh, he's at Stanford, uh, MD Anderson, UCSD, 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 actually a member of our uh, department, Dr. Jokers. And then most of this work was funded by the NIH Director's New Innovator Award. And I'm happy to take the last uh, eight minutes or so to answer questions. Yeah, so it really, it, so I've, I've done some work with, with palladium nano uh, structures. So palladium forms palladium hydride quite easily in the presence of hydrogen gas. Uh, but hydrogen gas is pretty rare in, uh, in the ambient environment. Um, and moreover, it goes back like almost immediately. So if you, if you, have a hydrogen in a balloon and you shine it and you shine it, you, you blow it onto these nano wires or even a palladium film, the conductivity will go way down. Then you remove the stream of hydrogen and it goes back up again. So it's, uh, it's, it's not too much of a concern, but um, it did cross my mind when we were doing this. Yeah, so, uh, so it's a lot easier to do a temperature measurement starting at room temperature than getting some dry ice or some liquid nitrogen or some Peltier cooler to do it at a lower temperature. We just didn't buy the thing <laughs> to do it. It's near zero TCR in the range and the range that we measured it. Yeah. Now it would be useful to get these low temperature measurements for much more fundamental studies of electron transport and Hall effects and things that people are interested in for graphene. But for practical wearable sensors, um, yeah, I mean to go outdoors and in the Midwest or the Northeast in January and expose it to the air, we would need to go lower than we did. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, that's it. It absolutely can. Um, 
the time scale will be different. The uh, EMG signal from chewing where it engages these muscles as opposed to swallowing where it engages these muscles will be different. What kind of hysteresis? So, uh, so hysteretic behavior in most strain sensors is due to viscoelasticity of the polymer component. So the polymer uh, that supports the graphene um, has liquid-like properties at, uh, at, at small strain rates and large time scales and solid-like properties at, uh, at short time scales and short strain rates. So when you put it on glass, you get no hysteresis. When you put it on a polymer, um, you, you can get hysteresis. And hysteresis is just kind of like uh, when you there's some lag in the response. Yep. Um, you mentioned that other groups are also working on um, a project that involves nanoparticles, nanoparticles and graphene. Um, I was wondering whether um, the work that you're doing in wood, was it inspired based on what um, I had heard before, or was it also based on other work that other groups were doing? Yeah, so in that case, um, so Alex kind of seeded this project, and then Brandon and Julian and Charles' work followed afterwards. Um, the work about on dysphagia, there were some other groups that did only EMG, um, but did not use a patient cohort. So our contribution was doing was adding the strain, the machine learning, and the uh, and the actual patient data because um, engineers don't often have access to clinical populations, clinical patients. Um, but if you can find a collaborator that really wants to use something that you're making in the lab, you can make a much bigger impact. Um, pretty much out of time, um, but thanks a lot for your attention. I hope this kind of gave you some, uh, some broader uh, appreciation for the kinds of solutions that you might be interested in for uh, design problems. This has been a UC San Diego podcast. For more, visit podcast.ucsd.edu.